let me start by asking you your assessment of the situation in Afghanistan right now with U.S. troops almost completely out after 20 years. Well, Judy, I think uh, the U.S. has really messed it up in Afghanistan. You see, first of all, they tried to look for a military solution in Afghanistan when there never was one. And people like me who kept saying that there's no military solution, who know the history of Afghanistan, we were called, people like me were called uh, anti-American. I was called Taliban Khan. Uh, for anyone who objected to this way of, uh, I don't know what the objective was in Afghanistan, whether it was uh, to uh, have some uh, nation building or democracy or liberate the women, whatever the cause was, um, the way they went about it was never going to be the solution. So when they finally decided that there is no military solution, unfortunately, they, uh, they, the, the bargaining power of the Americans or, or the NATO, NATO forces had gone. When there were 150,000 NATO troops in Afghanistan, that was the time to uh, go for a political solution. But well, once they had reduced the troops to barely 10,000, and then when they gave an exit date, the Taliban thought they had won. And so therefore, it was very difficult for now to get them uh, to compromise. It's very difficult to force them into a political solution. So because they think that, you know, they won. Well, whatever has happened in the past right now, uh, the Taliban are on the ascendancy. They are, in fact, saying President Ghani should step down from office right now. Do you think he should? Uh, you know, my view was that uh, when President Ghani went for the pres presidential election, already the talks with Taliban had started. And Pakistan, you know, I have to say, played a huge part in pressurizing the Taliban to talk to the Americans. So the Taliban were already talking to the Americans. Uh, and so I felt that uh, President Ghani should not have gone for, for his election then. He should have waited. He should have made an inclusive sort of, uh, the moment he held the elections, the Taliban became outsiders and he was the president. I felt that he should have delayed the election so that everyone could have been included in the election, electoral process. So they, they automatically there would have been some political settlement. But once he became the president, he then wanted the Taliban to come and talk to him. Taliban did not refuse to talk to him. They were, they, they, they were willing to talk to the Americans, to the other Afghan leaders, but they would not talk to President Ghani. And that's where the deadlock took place. Well, whatever has happened in the past, as we said, the Taliban now is on the uh, rise uh, in in Afghanistan, is that a good outcome for Afghanistan? See, the best, the, the only good outcome for Afghanistan is that if there is a political settlement which is inclusive, so they form some sort of a, uh, a government that, uh, that includes all sorts of different factions there, uh, and obviously Taliban part of that government. The worst situation in Afghanistan would be if there's a civil war and a protracted civil war. And from Pakistan's point of view, that is the worst case scenario, because we then, we, have, we face two scenarios. One, a refugee problem. Already Pakistan is hosting over three million Afghan refugees. And what we fear is that a, a, a protracted civil war would mean more refugees. Uh, and you know, our eco economic situation is not such that we can, uh, we can have another influx. Secondly, the worry is that the civil war will uh, flow into Pakistan. Because, you know, the Taliban are basically ethnic Pashtuns. Now, there are more Pashtuns on our side of the border than in Afghanistan. And so the worry is that if this goes on, uh, the, the Pashtuns on our side will be drawn into it. So that's, and that also is the last thing we want. And I do want to ask you about, pa about Pakistan. But before we leave Afghanistan, the United States has been asking your government for many years to help in the, uh, in the effort to limit, to fight 
the Taliban in Afghanistan. But the U.S., other organizations now say they have massive amounts of evidence that Pakistan has helped uh, the Afghan, uh, Afghan Taliban with uh, military, with intelligence, uh, has helped them financially. How do you explain that this is a terrorist group operating uh, in Afghanistan? How do you explain the support your government has given repeatedly over the years to the Afghan Taliban? Judy, I find this extremely unfair. Uh, and so you should know a little bit of the history. Come 9-11, Pakistan had nothing to do with what happened, uh, the terrorist act uh, in New York. Pakistan, uh, in the sense that Al-Qaeda was based in Afghanistan, there were no militant Taliban in Pakistan, no Pakistani was involved, and so when Pakistan, the Pakistani government decided to join the U.S.'s war on terror, this country took a was devastated by that. 70,000 Pakistanis died in that war, which we had nothing to do with. We had over $150 billion lost to the economy. Now, you know what happened in Pakistan? We had these, in the 80s, the militant groups created to fight the Soviets, funded by the Americans, trained by the, by the Pakistan army. When we joined the American war on terror, and, and these, groups were trained to fight foreign occupation, which was the Soviets. But now when the Americans came, uh, we told them that no, this is no longer a jihad, it's terrorism. They turned against Pakistan. So at one point, Judy, we had 50 different militant groups attacking the Pakistan army and, and the security forces. So we, as I said, lost 70,000 people to be blamed for NATO and U.S. not succeeding in Afghanistan, I find is extremely unfair. There, it's, it's, it's not the only thing that's blamed, but it's an important thing that's blamed, in that the, the Afghan Taliban has always been able to have a safe haven next door in Pakistan. And again, the U.S. says it has mountains of evidence that your ISI, other elements of the Pakistan military, have helped the Taliban in Afghanistan over the years, just uh, in the last few days, there's a report 10,000 Pakistan fighters have crossed over the border to help the Taliban in this most recent fighting. So this is going on right now. Judy, for a start, this 10,000 uh, Taliban, or they call the Afghan government, said jihadi fighters have crossed over. This is absolute nonsense. Why don't they give us evidence of this? Firstly, let me just go back. When they say that Pakistan gives safe havens, sanctuaries to Taliban, where are these safe havens? When, you, when we say there are three million Afghan refugees in Pakistan, who are, by the way, the same ethnic group as the Taliban, Pashtuns, now, there are camps of 500,000 people. There are camps of 100,000 people. And Taliban are not some military outfit. They are normal civilians. And if there are some civilians in these camps, how is Pakistan supposed to hunt these people down? How can you call them sanctuaries? Time and again, Pakistan has said, please take back these three million refugees. Huge burden on our economy. But Afghanistan was never in a situation. They've, they've, there's more or less been constant fighting for almost 40 years. So therefore, Pakistan is left with these refugees. Amongst these refugees, if they are Taliban fighters or supporters, how are we supposed to know? And this is, we have been saying this time and again to the U.S. Are you saying there's nothing that Pakistan could be doing to stand up uh, to the Taliban after all these years? And again, the border has become almost porous for Taliban to be able to go back and forth. What, let me ask you, Mr. Prime Minister, what relationship do you want now? with the United States. You've said under no circumstances would you allow the U.S. to set up uh, the CIA to have any sort of bases uh, in Pakistan to support counterinsurgency. Um, but are you saying no cooperation with the U.S. Uh, to fight uh, uh, terrorism? Judy, let me first clarify. The border between Pakistan and Afghanistan is 1,500 miles long. 
it is, a, it is one of the most mountainous countries, and it never had a border. This is called the Duran Line. People freely crossed uh, from one side to the other. The tribes were divided by the British when this border was made in 1947. So there was never any border. Now, what Pakistan has done, in order to stop these acquisitions that we are sending in uh, people from here, this is the first time the border has been fenced. We have spent a huge amount of money to fence 90% of the border today. It's, and finally, we will have a complete border there where there was nothing before. Now, when, when you say about US having bases of, for counterterrorism, please let me make you understand this. When a country loses 70,000 people and is bankrupted by this war on terror, when we joined the US uh, after 2000, uh, uh, after 9-11, uh, we do not have the capacity to have any more fighting within our border, any terrorism within our country, because when we were in the height of that uh, war on terror, which Pakistan joined, there were suicide bombs taking place all over the country. The businesses collapsed, tourism collapsed. So we are, we do, what we do not want to be is part of any conflict. Now, if there's a conflict going on in, in, in Afghanistan and there are bases in Pakistan, we then become targets. We will then become part of a conflict which we were in the last 15 years and we do not want. We want to be partners in peace, but not in conflict. So are you saying, what, so what sort of relationship uh, do you want? Do you, what do you expect from the United States at this point? You're looking for a trading relationship. What, what is it that you want your relationship with the United States to be after this very fraught period of the last 20 plus years? Well, uh, Judy, the last relationship was transactional. Pakistan was more like a hired gun. The U.S. says that we paid you, uh, uh, gave you aid, and that's why you were fighting this uh, so-called war on terror. Pakistan, on the other hand, felt that here was a country which had no need to be part of this war. It loses 70,000. I mean, where, which other country has lost 70,000 people fighting for someone, someone else's war? So Pakistanis felt that here we were fighting U.S.'s war, our economy devastated, Aid was minuscule compared to the amount of money we lost in the economy. And yet, we were blamed for the failure in Afghanistan. This is the Pakistani point of view. Now, Pakistan's position is very straightforward. We want to help, and we have helped, getting the Taliban to talk to the U.S., got them on the dialogue table, and this will be vouched by uh, Zal Zalmeh Khalil Zad, who's the... Uh, American point person uh, in Afghanistan and uh, talk, uh, uh, dealing with the Taliban. Uh, we have done our bit. Now, what we cannot afford now, if there is civil war, what US, US wants is bases in Pakistan, if there's civil war in Afghanistan. So, but if there's civil war in Afghanistan, bear in mind more than the, the, the Pashtuns in, uh, in, in um, Afghanistan, only about one-third to the, Pasht uh, the Pashtun population, so two-thirds are in Pakistan. We will immediately get stuck into it. There will be terrorism within Pakistan in support of the Pashtuns. We do not want, uh, apart from anything else, our country cannot afford it. We have just recovered from a, a, a desperate economic situation, and we do not want to go through it again. I hear that message. At the same time, do you expect that if the Taliban does succeed in Afghanistan, you're going to have a country next door where women, for one thing, are not allowed to have an education after the age of eight, that you're going to have a country uh, run by a group of terrorists, in effect? But, but Judy, uh, what are we supposed to do about it? I mean, here were the U.S. for two decades in Afghanistan trying to force a military solution. The reason why we are in this position now is because the military solution failed. Now, what choices have we got? The best choice is that somehow we have a political settlement in Afghanistan where it is, as I repeat, an inclusive government. So Taliban sit down with the, with the, with the other side and they form an inclusive government. This is the best outcome. We, there is no other outcome because the military solution has failed. Then why isn't Pakistan 
why can't Pakistan use more of your influence to get the Taliban to sit down and to agree to some sort of solution? Because right now, as you just said, that looks very, very difficult. Uh, but Judy, look, short of taking military action, and by the way, military action, how do you take military action against Taliban in Pakistan? Because apart from their leaders, a few families living here, they, all we have are refugee camps. And what are we supposed to do there to flush out in a camp of 500,000, how many hundreds of maybe uh, Taliban fighters are there? How do we know that? So Pakistan's response is that if you want us to help you, then take back the refugees, then hold Pakistan accountable. In this current situation, all we can do is whatever influence we have, push the Taliban for a political settlement. And I can tell you, no country has tried harder than us. Short of military action, we have done everything. But I repeat, when they see, when they think that the US is exiting and they are going to win, how much leverage have we got left? And in any case, half the of Afghanistan is in Taliban hand. Why do they, do they need sanctuaries in Pakistan? Are you prepared to accept Taliban victory next door? You, you're saying, in essence, there's nothing, you, nothing more Pakistan can do. Absolutely. There is nothing more we can do except push them as much as we can for a political settlement. That's all. But what happens in Afghanistan, we can only pray that the people of Afghanistan decide what government they want. And so we hope that that's what will happen in the end. They'll form some sort of an inclusive government. But that's for people of Afghanistan. As far as Pakistan is, uh, is concerned, we have done what we can. And if people want us, when they say there are some Taliban crossing over the border, well, we have three million refugees here. So if we can, if the refugees go across the border, then hold us accountable. Then we will guarantee that there's no one uh, will, uh, will uh, go across. But every day there are about 25,000 people who cross the border and come back because, because of uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the refugee situation here. Just final question, Mr. Prime Minister. You, if, if the Pakistan, I'm sorry, if the Afghan Taliban is successful, that gives more strength even to the Pakistan uh, Taliban. And its leader, Noor Wali Massoud, said in the last couple of days, quote, he's firmly hoping to take control of the Pakistani tribal border regions and make them independent. Uh, well, you see, this is the worry because when, uh, Pakistan was facing uh, militancy and terrorism, uh, you know, from 2005 onwards to almost 2015, 10 years. We had, we, what, was, what came into existence was the Pakistan Taliban. And this guy you are mentioning is, is a Pakistani Taliban. They were the Afghan Taliban, they were the Pakistani. And one of the groups that was attacking the Pakistani security forces was this uh, tariq -e taliban uh, and I, I, uh, ex this is exactly what I said. Worry is, my worry is that if there's a protracted civil war in Afghanistan, we will have this overflowing into our country. And yes, it worries us. Last thing, I do want to ask you, just take just a moment to ask you about a comment you made about the role of women uh, in, in your country. You said in an interview last month that women themselves bear a large part of the responsibility for the a concerning rise in the number of rape cases in Pakistan. I want to ask you if you truly believe that. I mean, you're someone, you've lived in the West, you've traveled widely around the world. Do you believe women bear a large part of the responsibility for this? Look, Judy, anyone who commits rape, solely and solely that person is responsible. So let's be clear about that. No matter whatever, how, how much ever a woman is provocative or whatever she wears, the, the person who commits rape, he is fully responsible. Never is the victim responsible. My comments were completely taken out of context. They were simply talking about Pakistan society where we are having a rise, a sharp rise in sex crimes. And sex crime does not include just women. More than uh, rape, uh, child abuse, which is going through the roof. So my comments were in that context, and it was 
I use the word parda in, in Islam. Parda does not mean just clothes. And parda is not restricted to women only. Parda is for men as well. It means bringing the temptation down in a society. This is what I was talking about. And it was taken out of deliberately. And I, I have to say, because I know all the interviews I've given, never would I say such a stupid thing where a person who's raped is responsible for somehow. Uh, it's always the rapist that is responsible. Do you believe that, that, um, that the importance in your country of Islam uh, complicates your ability to, to do something, to take a stronger stand against violence against women? Absolutely not. Islam gives dignity, respect to women. In fact, let me say, having traveled all over the world, I find that in Muslim countries, uh, in Pakistan, uh, even in other Muslim countries I've seen, women have m far more treated with respect and given more dignity. You have odd cases everywhere in the world, but you look at the situation in Pakistan even now, I mean, look at the rape cases here compared it to Western countries, they are minuscule compared to them. Yes, we have our issues, we have certain cultural problems, every nation has that. But that comes with cultural evolution, with education. But as far as a woman's dignity goes, respect, I can say after going all over the world, this society gives more respect and dignity to women. Prime Minister Imran Khan, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. وزیر اعظم عمران خان امریکی نشریاتی ادارے پی بی ایس کو انٹرویو دے رہے تھے جس میں ان کا کہنا تھا کہ اس وقت امریکہ افغانستان میں بری طرح پھنس چکا ہے پاکستان نے طالبان کے ساتھ مذاکرات میں اہم کردار ادا کیا امریکہ افغان مسئلے میں ناکام ہو چکا ہے افغانستان میں ایسی حکومت بنائی جانی چاہیے تھی جس میں سب فریقین کو شامل کیا جاتا انہوں نے کہا کہ افغان مسئلے کا واحد حل سیاسی تصویر میں ہے امریکہ افغان مسئلے کا فوجی حل نکالنے میں ناکام رہا ہے